Perfect. So hello and welcome to this week and Shore Solutions, the webinar. And we are absolutely thrilled to have you with us today. We are recording this webinar. So for those of you that weren't able to make it live, we are able to send you a copy of this recording. And this week we have two people on this webinar who I'm pretty fond of, to be completely honest. So I am Mara Shore, and I am a partner in Shore Solutions. We are a practice management consulting firm, in case you have not met our acquaintance yet. My father is Jay Shore, and so depending where on the screen he is for you, Brady Bunch style, you will see Jay Shore. Jay is the founder of Shore Solutions, and Jay is going to be your host for this particular webinar. We're going to be talking about how to make money while you sleep, how to make money when you're not in the office, because we know that as offices are closing down, this is more and more of an issue. We are absolutely thrilled to have as our guest on this week's Shore Solutions, the webinar, Sam Peek. Sam, Hi. give me a, just a something ridiculous. Ridiculous is what I do best. So there'll I be know. plenty of that, plenty of music in my head, dancing along as we do this. So Perfect. Yeah, so good. We have known, we have had the pleasure of knowing Sam P for many, many years now. Sam is the founder of Incredible Marketing, although they are based in California. They help clients with their digital products across the world. They are truly an amazing international company when it comes to digital marketing from websites to social media, graphic design, email marketing, SEO, and everything in between. Sam is here to lend an absolutely incredible view into this into today's topic. So without further ado, everybody is muted for the sake of this webinar. If you have any questions, I encourage you, there is a chat function. And so go ahead, send messages into the chat. I also encourage you, I'm going to be sending, um, sending out a couple of questions and answers, send, ask those as well. And I'm going to be sending out a couple polls along the way to find out. So to get started, I would love to find out where everybody is based, if you are surgical, non-surgical, and if your practice is currently open right now. So go ahead, get that started in the chat. And in the meantime, let's go ahead and get this party started for Shore Solutions, the webinar. Take it away, gentlemen. Okay, let's get after it. So Sam, it is uh, an absolutely uh, pleasure to see you, uh, even if it has to be virtual. I know that you and I go back for several years as moderators, co-moderators, lecturer, co-lecturers co at a dozen conferences during the year. We see you, we see your team, you see us, you saw us almost from the very, very beginning. Uh, from when almost was just Mara and I, or just myself. And, you know, it's a crazy world out there. You and I had the, the opportunity to speak right before we went live. And uh, what I'd like to start is uh, by asking you, you know, what you're seeing out there, because the topic is how to make money. You know, I, I like to say, how do you make money when you sleep? And how do you do these things you know, for the sake of all the practices we're in this pandemic right now. And this is really going to be a conversation, Sam, between you and I as industry professionals, because um, we basically touch the same type of vertical in the aesthetic cosmetic industry. I know you spread a lot further than we do. We are strictly in the aesthetic cosmetic space and you are international. Uh, we're strictly domestic for the most part. And, you know, I guess I'll ask you, uh, first of all, let me just say it's great to see you. Um, people really don't know that um, I have a pseudo twin brother. Um, he's just not really alive. But so for the sake of it, Sam, can you just show my twin brother who... who well, he travels. He travels. So, and he's, he's around. He comes to every webinar I'm in, everything that's distance. Um, I take photos with him. Even when you're not around, you're not welcome. Um, and he just kind of like pops into places just like this randomly. My, brother, my twin brother has more hair than me. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing how that <laughs> happened, right? It goes with me literally everywhere. I'm not joking to whomever is seeing this. Um, Jay was kind enough to give this to me graciously as a Christmas gift one year. And so it stays in my car and it comes with me every single place I go. Um, it's a great time. It's, There's a long fantastic. story. There's a long story and it's not PG and we're not going to no. go down that route today, but yeah, it's a good time. So but that being said, I, I know it, people's times are, you know, in flux. There's a lot of things going on, but 
you know, for the sake, I mean, I've been on probably a dozen webinars at this point over the last couple of months and maybe more. And I, I think at this point, we just really need to delve as deep and as honest and transparent as we can and just kind of answer some of the questions that you guys still have out there, both about, you know, what's happening or what's going to be happening, um, how to address things. And obviously, if you do have concerns and, and interest, you know, to in the chat, hit up Mara and she'll get it to us or, um, you know, obviously send us questions afterwards. Um, cause we, at the end of the day, I know Jay very well. I know Mara very well. Uh, everyone's here to help. Everyone wants to make sure that you get the information that you need to the best of, of, of our ability to help you navigate through all of this. And, um, yeah, and I'll try and keep the answers, I guess, a little bit different instead of the plain vanilla stuff that, I feel like I've been hearing on a lot of the different webinars with a lot of the different things and we'll try and shy away from the, this is the new normal uh, taglines and stuff like that. And let's, right. let's do the best we can. Shall we? Sounds great. You know, um, right. you know, Sam, it's funny because I tell people, I, I really don't want to use that term new normal anymore. I, I want to call it it's normal because similar to that of nine 11, when you had to take your shoes and your belt off and then show your, your laptop, you know, it became new normal, but now everybody never thinks of it as a, it gives it a second thought. It's normal. And going forward, the things that we're calling new normal today really are going to be normal tomorrow. All right. And with you uh, and your company, the team that you've built for the things that you do to help clients and we have mutual clients together that, you know, you handle their website and their digital marketing and our clients for the last couple of months and uh, have been closed. Like you, I have participated in a dozen webinars and podcasts and we're now chairing these as well. So we wanted you as an industry professional because when you're handling a lot of the digital marketing and websites for your clients, what are the top things that you're saying to somebody? Because we were just talking about restaurants are closed. Let's not talk about restaurants. We'll talk about ours. But when a practice closes, you know, what are the top three things and protocols when you're closed that you should be doing to keep your patient perspective patient even front of mind to choose you the practice yeah i uh, i i think the answer to this is is at this point hopefully fairly common practice and if your practice has been closed it looks like it might make close again or whatever the case might be it's relatively pretty simple right which is reach out to them and the vehicle that you have for that right now is social media even though the office is closed and even though you're not doing procedures and even though there's not a sale going on and even though um, you don't have a lot of the traditional ways that you utilize social media for your practice, that doesn't mean that you can't remain active in order to build that connection and truly stay front of mind. I think that uh, above all else that has been shown, especially right now, to be the channel of choice in order to communicate. I think that I reach, you know, probably 300 emails a day into my inbox and they talk about new COVID this and updates and what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. And I probably engage with that a lot less nowadays than I do uh, with social media for practices that I'm trying to see, oh, are they open or are they not open? What's going on? What regulations and, and stuff do I have going on? So that would be obviously my first advice. So Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is you're using, make sure that you keep using that even if you are closed. Um, secondly, and this is the one that probably frustrates me the most. I know I brought it up a little bit ago with Mara and I, and I know this is a topic that is near and dear to your heart, but answer the phone. And I, I just cannot stress this enough. Your website is still active. People are at home. They are either working or they are not, or they are taking care of the kids, but they will find time to log in and start researching about the things that they have going on in their life that they have more time to focus on, right? And to do research and to understand that when things get up and running, uh, I need this procedure or I am looking for this solution or a new doctor or whatever the case might be. So make sure that you're answering phones, inquiries, emails, all of that kind of stuff. I've talked to too many practices, just far too many where the response rates are completely non-existent or very low or the processes that they have are, I'm checking the machine twice a week 
or right. whatever the case is. It just, I mean, it's baffling to me, but it is what it is. And I think that more important than anything, you have to make sure that that protocol is followed. You have something um, that is, is right in the forefront of, of handling that. And then I guess third is just planning, planning to the best of your ability. And, and obviously we understand that with so many variables, there's so many things going on and things are changing weekly, monthly, hourly, daily, however you want to quantify that. It, it definitely is going in, in different directions. It feels like all the time, but it's okay to say, look, I plan on opening here. I plan to have these times open for consultations or even better I'm still doing virtual consultations whilst the office is closed, getting you ready for your actual procedure when we are allowed to be close to one another face-to-face, so to speak. So I think those are the three things I would take away is try and still do consultations if you can. Make sure you're answering your phones and your emails and not lacklusterly and do them promptly um, like it's, you know, money. It should be a cha-ching sound every time you're email web inquiry comes through or your phone's ringing. Um, Yeah. I mean, I I think those are the things stay engaged in social media. And then we can talk about some other ways of making money that has to do with e-commerce and some other things. But those are the things that I would do while your office is closed. Right. What are you talking, how could you share um, some expertise on dedicated personnel? Um, Because we've gone through the PPP stage, you know, which ended June 30th. And for those who want to go for the 24 weeks, and that's a whole other webinar, you know, of right. accounting of right. PPP. We won't get into that for the sake of this. I've done so many webinars on the PPP program. And unfortunately, as soon as I do them, my time date stamped them now with Zoom so that when somebody listens to it, they're saying, Jay, that's old stuff. Well, I said, well, yeah, well, if you look at when the date was, you'll notice that it was kind of old stuff. All right. Look at the newest one that we've done. All right. So how should you actually prepare your staff? What would you suggest? Because as a web designer, as a web SEO, as a hosting company, um, what would you suggest actually um, for putting onto your website when somebody is going to look? They don't know if you're open. They don't know if you're closed. Naturally, this newest thing, as soon as you go onto any doctor's website, you see this COVID-19 thing pop up, right? from Google. So my question is, what do you suggest as a web company that you put maybe as a flash up or something like that when you go on to a doctor's website to tell the patient or prospect what you should be, uh, you know, about your practice? What is your recommendation? Right. So first things first, Mara, just so you know, I can see uh, what's going on. So when you're showing your screen like that, it was like multiple slides all over the place. Make sure we're looking at just the one that's like most current with the question. Um, but to answer your question, from a technological perspective, yes, Google's doing what he can. Um, you know, the hours in your kind of Google My Business, you have the ability to update that or work with your agency to update the hours, the times, appointments, this and that. Make sure you get all that information. There's a great handy section um, actually in Google on the right hand side. And you'll see it most of the time. They'll have questions and answers. Um, you can have those questions and answers right now about COVID, um, or more importantly, you can put up bulletins, news flashes, things like that straight through your Google My Business section. Um, so even before someone lands on your website, uh, they should have what's called the knowledge graph and all this information on, on uh, the right-hand side uh, that shows your hours and, and everything else, your contact information. And below that, you should be able to produce some information so you can actually talk about Um, anything that's related to COVID. But from a a technological perspective, when they get to your website, you're going to want to address it, all right? I think the worst thing that you could do right now is not have any information because then people just don't know, right? I mean, it's just like calling a restaurant. If you don't know that they have updated hours, if you don't know that they're doing in-person or takeaway only, or if they're closed or whatever, if you go to their website and there's no information about it at all, I almost presume that the place is closed or they're not dealing with anything because they're not saying, hey, I have updated information for you. Um, And so I think that as much as people kind of want to distance themselves a little bit from some of this, um, I, I think it's important to show that you're relevant and you're staying on top of things and you're staying current. Um, And that can be as simple as a banner at the top, you know, COVID-19 extra measures, click here. Um, Again, from a technology perspective, if you run a pop-up 
um, on your site that automatically flashes when someone gets to your site. You have to do so in a coding perspective that is beneficial for your site, doesn't block things like um, the Google bots and, and, and things like that. That's a full another conversation that we don't need to delve into here. Um, just make sure that it's being coded out properly so that you don't block the rest of your site. Um, and also make sure that you have some sort of cookie enabled on it or um, so that if you're not going on every single page of your website, it gets highly annoying. If every page you click through and you get through four or five or six, uh, the notification keeps popping up and you can't kind of can't get rid of it. Um, or even conversely, if I click it away and leave and come back later and it comes back again. Uh, there's ways to, to work around that. So make sure that you're working with your agency, your firm, whomever, your IT right. person to make sure that that's all set up like that. How would you have suggested and how will you suggest? Because you brought up a very, very good point about it may happen again. Now, you know, some places aren't even out of phase one. You know, I'm here in South Florida and we are, uh, I always love being number one at what I do except this. All right. I live here in South Florida, just uh, miles out of Dade County. I'm in the Fort Lauderdale, Broward County area. And we're number one. Um, not something I like to be proud of, the number one in cases, but then, you know, uh, the Houston number two and California, you're not far behind. However, what is your opinion um, on the telemedicine, even when you're open, because you may have limited or staggered hours so I want to get into this to like a bifurcated question. If you've done it before and it may happen again, what about staggered hours of procedures that you can come in? So, you know, social distancing and things like that and setting up telehealth appointments, but allowing people to know how would you allow people to know that technology wise? So I guess I cannot stress this enough. For 95% of you guys that are, are listening, tuning in, seeing this at a later date, whatever the case is, you have to get on this bandwagon. It is, you know, we talked about this whole new normal term. I absolutely abhor earlier in this uh, podcast, but it is absolutely critical that you embrace this, you move along with this, and you allow this to some extent to transform your practice. It is, there are so many more benefits than those that outweigh the potential risks or anything else to go along with it. Uh, the ability to be amenable, to be reachable, to schedule more people, to get more done, to have a bit less formality, to um, schedule conveniently for you and the potential patient to uh, adapt to things in better and more real time. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a lot of procedures that not only have to be applied right now with everything that's going on, but even back in the day, getting a patient from the front door to the back to consultation to this to that and out is manpower and time and effort and a lot of stuff that's going on. And now to be able to see someone on a phone, on a computer, on whatever it is, and be able to connect with them that way is efficient. And the data is not here for aesthetic medicine necessarily yet. I'm sure that's going to come. But if you look at medicine grouped and clumped overall, you have numbers of physicians that are able to see more patients by volume than they ever have before. Fact. Now, obviously, there's a tactile function that you are missing, um, you know, and there are certain things that potentially just may not be solvable via telehealth, and it's not going to fix everything all the time. But the consults and the being able to do follow-up and everything else that you are able to accomplish and you are able to do it at a convenience level for them and a convenience level for you and the office I mean, you can stack four or five people in a virtual waiting room and get through that in minutes. Very quickly. You know what I'm saying? And people yes. aren't uncomfortable. They're not sitting in a chair in a waiting room with a mask and watching 
some sort of video that they don't want to watch and it's too loud. And then all of a sudden I, they're just, they have to drive and they have to get back to none of that works nowadays. This level of convenience that has been brought and kind of thrust upon this, um, this industry, I think is to some extent a godsend. I think it's you know going what, to what's funny help people. Sam, is um, what's funny um, is what used to be frowned upon is really embraced. I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I'm on adjunct faculty. I teach at Florida Atlantic University in medical business management. And I taught all last semester live in front of the classroom. And then I, in the second semester, this that just uh, ended, I've, I taught the first two sessions live and then we went online. And I'm not used to teaching online because as you know, I'm very animated and I like to be in, and walk around the room and talk to yeah. people. Yeah. And it went, it went online, kind of like the virtual telehealth that aesthetic cosmetic practices always said, no, 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 no that's not for me. However, I've had more people embrace it and tell me how much they really enjoy it and how much more time efficient it really is. So, Mara, let's get that. To the, well, you know, Sam, I'd like to get to our, our, our next question. Um, so, you know, as we get ready for this phase two, like I, I think I was getting back to, we never really got out of phase one here. We're starting to get into phase two. All right. Is, all right, Mara, you can go back. Um, how should a team respond to to after hours. Mar, just so you'll know, you're, you're showing all of the slides at one time versus one slide at a time. All right. Um, come back to Sam and I, please. So when the office is closed, you know, what do you think are the top three protocols that you should be doing and who should be doing it? Because I've tried to explain to our clients what we're setting up are specific Look, I, I, I've always preached policies, procedures, protocols before PPP was even and PPE was the buzzword. I've always said to have protocols in place, have a playbook so that, you know, I know you're an avid sports fan. So as am I, you know, it's, it's no secret when a person comes in from the sideline to hand the play to the quarterback, we should already have that play to the quarterback in the practice. So what top protocols do you think that a practice should have in place? Who should be responsible for doing it to enforce it as well? Well, I mean, I, I don't think that this question is much different than the one we already talked about, which is reaching your existing patients. Um, but you know, the, the protocols which is answer the phone, stay engaged on social media, um, and maybe I'll, I'll switch it up, I guess, just a little bit differently, is uh, stay connected with your staff so that your staff can communicate effectively to the people that they're communicating with. Um, I think that when your office is, is, is shut down or running on reduced hours or whatever the case is, part of this has to be communication, right? Um, virtual consults are happening. Uh, people are answering the phone. Maybe there's reduced scheduled times uh, for consultations and things like that. So uh, it, it really just comes down to communication. And I guess one of the overall kind of protocols that uh, perhaps I want to touch on just in general is the follow-up by the physician, owner, whomever is at the kind of top of that pyramid in the practice. Um, to know what's going on. Now, this sounds elementary, and this sounds uh, something out of a straight, you know, business 101 course, but you need to know, are people calling? Are people wanting to book? What is going on? Are we still spending money doing something from a marketing perspective? And if so, is there some sort of return from that? And there's too many times, you know, I'm in conversations with doctors, practice owners, you know, administrators, whatever the case might be. And I'll ask a relatively simple question and the blank stares or the, that's not my department or I don't get involved with that at its very core. There's a certain, um, there's a certain few KPIs baseline things you need to know. And, and one of them, I guess, at its most critical, especially right now, 
which is what's my demand? Are people calling? Are they coming in? And why? And I think part of this leads into, I think, a question we're going to touch on a little bit later. But I see that for the most part, our practices have been busy. Since things have reopened, and again, regional specific here, um, but you know whether you're in Northeast, Southwest, whatever the case might be, people have patients that are looking for services and they are coming in they are booking time they're getting their procedures done and you see a backlog of what is coming right the problem is is i don't think the right questions are being asked in the sense of are these existing patients are these new patients where are these coming from and most importantly kind of what is my new patient ratio versus my existing patient ratio and has that declined or dropped off at all because what's going to happen is that people as a as a practice you're going to go through this backlog at some point in time you're going to make it through and depending on how fast you can ramp up and how many patients you can see per day etc etc at some point in time you're going to make it past the ones who were waiting whilst you were closed and then when it got busy to opening back up and people wanted to come in and then you're going to have to look around and say hey am i as busy as i was this time last year or do you see the trends of that already happening now and there are markers there are indicators that you can be looking for now to determine hey what's it going to be like in september october to the best of your ability, which obviously right now is a little bit difficult. But I think that's the number one thing I try to preach when I'm doing some of these webinars is, yeah, you might be busy now. But unfortunately, that might not be the case for very long. That brings up a very good point because uh, a lot of our clients are telling us we are so backlogged now when we returned. And I said, yeah, that's because you've had the people and the pent up demand that are all coming in and you really, you're having staggered hours and you're not running, you know, to the wall, to this, the expression goes to the walls so that you can handle all of it. However, it will level out at one point in time after you fill that demand and other understand that when that demand comes, all right, you're, once you level out, how do you respond to it? All right, so um, Mara, come back to Sam and I for a second because um, I, I wanted to ask that you, you mentioned something about people not having the responsibility to answer the return on your investment. And we call it the conversion cascade because all we can ask our website designer, our digital marketing company to do is make the phone ring. And I hear so many times, you know, my website company, my digital marketing company, they're really not doing their job because I can't close the leads. And I said, well, you know, I got like 100, 120 leads came in and, you know, we only got 10 of them. And I say, you got that many leads, then the problem is not your marketing company. The problem is you. So it's that conversion from market to call call conversion to consult, consult conversion to treatment, all right, and then determine what that is. Now, being closed, what are you suggesting, you know, let's say after hours and weekend, because there has been so much conjecture, and I've been preaching for years that the early bird catches the worm. People don't, they, and people have told me people don't want to be bothered, don't call them at night, don't call them on the weekend, yet the lead just came in at seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. Now understand you and I have a three hour time difference from zone to zone, but even on a weekend, people say, no, you have some people that celebrate Sabbath on Saturday, and then you have others that celebrate the Sabbath on Sunday and they're going to church and they don't want to be bothered. Yet I laugh at that, not that they celebrate Sabbath. I laugh at the fact that people are writing in on the weekend, and yet the staff is telling me they shouldn't respond on weekend. Could you give some uh, insight on how you feel? How soon after the lead comes in should you respond? And then what about after hours and on weekends? Because after Friday at five or six, I don't care what coast you're on, until Monday seems a little ridiculous. I, I mean, it's wild to me. Again, it, it's not the way I would run a practice, and it's 
I think you really see a mindset difference, both generationally in our world. Um, those that, you know, shut off at Friday at four o'clock and don't come back until Monday, Monday morning. And those that understand that this is a business. And when you see this as a bit business and not just a medical business, but a, a, a consumer driven business, I mean, I think things change, right? Like if you're going to lease an apartment and you call three places and the first one that calls you back and, and gets you in there to take a look at, uh, look at the place, you know, the chances of you closing that person are the highest. And that's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. Now, there's obviously a very fine line between being uh, responsive and being nuts. So let's not cross that line into being nuts. If you're getting a lead at 11 o'clock at night and you want to pick up the phone and call them right then and there, I don't think that that's necessarily the right way of doing this. Um, but a, a couple of tips for those of you out there that, that, that have this going on. I mean, by all means, uh, write some of this down. First off, have a good autoresponder. So, you know, not something that just says, hey, got your email, but Maybe that gives a little bit more information, right? And taking that to the next level, if you can discern how and why uh, they contacted you, so maybe you have some sort of self-selection tool uh, on your website for the type of procedure that they're interested in. Hi, I'm interested in fillers. Well, then your autoresponder says, hey, I saw that you were interested in fillers. We'll be in touch with you tomorrow. Um, in the meantime, take a look at this awesome, amazing, wonderful, dare I say, incredible content that we put together for you on fillers. Have a peruse of, of that and uh, I'll be back with you tomorrow. It's, again, a really good autoresponder can go a long way. Um, secondly, if someone is reaching out to you, it is fair game to reach back out to them. Now, I think that um, customarily, we have to be careful of phone calls and interruptions. And especially depending on your demographic, I'm a big fan of texting um, and having that capability within the office, within the patient care coordinator, um, who, whomever is driving that. You have the ability to have someone reach out to you and you reach back out to them uh, via text to message kind of uh, technology. I think that if you can do that, it's smart. Um, you know, you, you might respond with a text message again, Friday night at 11 PM, or, uh, you might just wait till the next day, but at least you've hit them email text, and then you can follow up with a phone call. Um, but again, like you said, to get something in on a Friday afternoon and not follow back up until Monday to me is, is, is crazy. I don't think that there's an expectation, you know, if someone fills something out Saturday night at midnight, that Sunday, they're necessarily going to get a call back. So maybe you do wait till Monday. Um, but again, if you can be on your game, and I guess I would say that the most successful practices are the ones that have people that are answering questions, you know, 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. seven days a week. All right. So and let me. If you can do that, then, then you're going to be ahead of 95% of the other people that are out there, if not more. All right, so let me break that into another question here because there are multiple types of autoresponders and texting platforms and uh, third parties that do it. So you know that when you're calling AT&T or you're calling Verizon or you're calling, I, I don't believe you are physically getting AT&T and Verizon or Best Buy. I think they have a service. And the reason I say this third-party service Businesses versus somebody that may work for the company is contingent upon the keyword that you text in, you will get in a microsecond an answer back. So you know that the autoresponders are driven by keywords. Of course. All right. Which many times is very annoying to me because I not only am a business owner, I'm a consumer and I buy. And sometimes I buy without necessarily worrying whether or not it is the least expensive price, but it is the most convenient for me at the time. All right. Now, when you're saying about automating it, how do you suggest to automate it? 
And then of course, the follow-up of that automation and to drive them to your site, maybe buy a keyword. So if somebody's writing into you about a filler, about a laser, how do you think it would be best to automate back to that patient or client in the med spa to direct them to your site as a designer, as a developer, as digital marketing? You know, what, what do you think is the best way so that it, it really locks them into you. It keeps them on your site. It keeps them engaged. All right. So let's really dive into it. So I, I have, again, some, some pointers and some tips and, and some of it might be counterintuitive to the things that you've heard previously. So uh, let's just kind of, let's kind of go after it. First off, you definitely want to direct people back to your website whenever possible. So have content there, have information there, share um, educate, uh, you know, really kind of build that, that base of knowledge and trust with your patient, potential patient. So uh, definitely do that. Now, where it gets a little bit counterintuitive is with some of the autoresponders and some of the, um, you know, like you said, you, you send in a code or a text or a word or whatever, and it puts you in this and you get an autoresponder back. Um, and the studies generally show a couple of things. First off, surprisingly, the longer the autoresponder is, the less engagement there is. Okay. Now, the correlative to this typically is that people know when things are automated and people know when things are real. And typically in our business and w the things that we do, people want real interactions, right? They're not looking for the right printer setting to, uh, you know, print a color document off or, or uh, they're not looking for that type of solution. They are unique. They're special. And they want someone to answer their questions question precisely even if it has been answered for a sure solution is a sure right? solution there you go so that being said identify the stuff that is coming automatically and identify the stuff that is coming to them specifically so as opposed to hi Anne, thank you for reaching out to our practice below is a series of topics i think you would find interesting. We will review your questions and get back to you at a later date or whatever the case is. Something more to the effect of, hi, this is our autoresponder. No one's around right now, but in the meantime, until tomorrow, here's some stuff that you can read and catch up that we think is on point with what it is that you're looking for. And then when you actually reach out to Ann, say, hi, Ann, I'm Sam. Uh, it's nice to meet you. I saw your question. Here's what I think you're looking for, which is the short answer. Um, but I'm sure you have more questions than just this. Um, but how do you, when do you want to chat that Sam? Um, when it's a text uh, immediately, if it's not live so that you don't direct them to a laser hair removal, uh, question if it's for Botox and vice versa, because that could be a turnoff as well. Right. So again, there's some specific things that you can do to have self-selection. So, you know, there's forms on your website where you can say, um, not only do they fill out their name and phone number and email and this and that, but they can also put in the uh, type of procedure that they're most interested in and what it is that they're looking at. You can even be a little more sneaky about it and see the pages where they're spending the most amount of time. And obviously you're using some sort of cookie and, and tracking that information, obviously for analytics and for other other information you want to use later to retarget them or whatever the case might be. So if you can tag, you know, what page did they come from or what are they interested in or where are they spending most of their time, you can create campaigns that follow up with that based on, on those types of uh, metrics. Um, or you can just be more general about it. And, and that's okay too. Just directing people to say, hey, find our list of procedures here or here's some more information in our blog. It's separated by category. Um, and I'm going to give you a ring or a text message tomorrow. And then again, even with something automated, I love to end in a question, right? Because it gets them thinking and hopefully it gets them engaging as quick as possible, which is, hey, what is the best time for me to reach out to you? Is it better in the morning? Is it better in the afternoon? <coughs> Pardon me. So um, as soon as you can get them engaged, whether it's through an autoresponder or whether it's through chat or whether it's live or whether it's a text message, 
um, you have at least broken down that very initial step, that border, that, um, that kind of contact wall between me and you. And if you can do that as quick as possible, uh, the chances of you having a second, third, fourth communication and getting them through the door, it just grows exponentially. Okay, so let's talk about that second, third, and fourth communication of continuous follow-up. So uh, what do you suggest follow-ups be from the time that the initial engagement comes in and then they write to you and then you don't hear from them and then you follow it up with them again and then you can have auto follow-up and you don't hear from them again or you do and they haven't scheduled you know, a, an appointment to come in, uh, assuming that we're open. All right. Uh, and then they have that consult and then they haven't booked the procedure. I've always got to ask my wife. I have to ask my husband. I have to check my finances. Um, could you share what you believe the continuous stream of follow up? How much is too often and how much is not enough? It depends. I mean, at the end of the day, it really just depends. You have to understand the persona of the person that you're dealing with and the procedure that they're interested in. You will have someone look in, uh, look at, get information, consult, etc., for a facelift for potentially years. And you have to understand that that's the life cycle of what that patient is going through. Whereas, and again, just talking about surgical procedures uh, comparison, you could have someone potentially going through the breast dog cycle from consults or from, from engagement online to in office to consult to procedure in a week, two weeks. So I, I think that if you understand what they're interested in and you understand the motivation for doing it, um, I, I think that the follow-up changes from that. Um, personally, good rule of thumb, um, two of everything. So at least two phone calls, two text messages, two emails, right? And if you're getting six no's all the way across the board, uh, then it's time for you to kind of send one last Hail Mary and just say, hey, I haven't heard from you. I left phone calls and, and text messages, but at the very end of the day, I don't want to bug you. So this is going to be it. And just so you know, I'm dropping you into our email list, and when you're ready, come back through. Something like that, and being, again, very transparent, honest, maybe a little bit quirky, funny, depending on what your personality and the personality of the practice is, being different, setting yourself apart, breaking down that necessarily that, that, that old school thinking of that wall of professionalism. I'm not saying don't be professional. What I'm saying is adding your flavor to it. Um, and I, I think if you do that, I think if you reach out at least that many times, um, you're giving people the opportunity to respond to you in the medium in which they choose. Um, you know, sometimes I, I almost never, you're never going to get me on the phone at first try. Um, my emails, if it's very compelling, but text messages more often than not, because like a lot of other people, I don't like notifications in my text messages. I want to be able to clear that stuff out relatively quickly. So I'm either going to delete the message or I'm going to respond to it or, or do some sort of action to it because it's the quickest form, right? It's right. something I always have on me. You know, it's funny. Mara has a, um, a wonderful way to do it. What she'll do is even if we know the person got the email, she'll say, you know, I, I just want to follow up because I'm not sure if my original email went to spam. Well, if the original went to spam, probably so is this one. However, it doesn't make it seem like, hey, I'm following up because you never answered me back. It's not you. It's me. You know, that, that kind of a scenario. Um, you know, a quick follow up. Real quick, Jay, just, uh, to, just to play down devil's advocate. I, I'm, maybe I'm going to disagree with you just a little bit. I don't oh, That's mind. not unusual though. I, not that. at all, right? Like <laughs> I, I don't mind putting the onus on the patient. I don't mind saying, hey, you reached out to me. I reached back out. You're not answering. And I don't want to waste your time. I mean, again, obviously you have to figure out the tone and then the way you want to communicate that. But I think that it's fine to say something to the effect of, um, I'd really love to be able to provide you information. Um, you know, you didn't get back to me from the phone call and the email that I left. You know, if, if you don't want information or if you don't want to schedule a time, that's fine as well. Or however it is you want to position it, 
I don't think it's anything fine where we have to tiptoe and dance around. You can call it what it is, you know, and just say, hey, I'd really like to talk to you about this. I'd love to have you being a patient of the practice. But if not, I certainly don't want to waste your time. Correct. You know, I'll give you a um, quick, quick story. And, you know, that's very impossible for Jay to do. I don't, I, I can never do anything and, and make a quick story. But you're talking about follow-up right away. Um, about a year, two, about two years ago, um, I happened to have been looking for uh, a motorcycle. And I went online and at one of the local motorcycle dealers, I saw the bike I wanted. And I filled out a quick form online. This is the the bike, and they had it in stock and inventory, and whether they did or they didn't, I really didn't know, and I filled it out, and 20 minutes later, I get a phone call, and the gentleman says, I got your inquiry, you know, at, what are you doing this afternoon? No, it's on a Sunday morning, I sent it, and Sunday afternoon, I'm watching football. That's what I'm doing. He yeah, says, don't bother me. No. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, for my, uh, one o'clock, I'm watching football. At four o'clock, I'm watching football. <laughs> He says, it's a beautiful day. Why don't you come out and take the bike out for a ride? Well, anybody that has a bike or a fancy car knows it's like taking a puppy home for the weekend. All right. And I, I'm almost impossible to close right away. I went out. My wife and I took a ride on the bike. The bike was mine. Now, had this person not called me and given me the opportunity, because he was not the only Harley dealer that I had called, Similar to that of cosmetic surgical doctors and things like that, the early bird will catch the worm if you have a quality product. Because as Smile Doctor Rich Castellano says, you're never an interruption of anybody's time when you have something interesting to say. I may be late for my next appointment or whatever, but if you have me engaged, I was yours from hello. All right. So getting back now, let's talk about websites. Um, you know, when we're managing clients and their operational and financial uh, acumen, um, they all say that the equipment manufacturers, website designers, and EMR people are their three most loved and three most disliked vendors. Um, I happen to think your EMR and your website vendors are probably your two most needed vendors because there's so much equipment out there for all the different procedures that you want to buy, but you've got to check a patient in and check a patient out and collect your money and you've got to market. So how, give us your top tip in how you transform your website when there's a brand new prospect, because we deal with a lot of brand new people going into the business or changing website vendors and have them consider it not to be an expense, but a revenue generator? Man, that's a loaded question. A lot to unpack right there. Um, all right, I'll all right. compact so it into how do you convince them that it's not an expense, but it's a revenue generator only. All right. It's so let, let, yeah, let's take this in different parts. First off, as to your question, or as to kind of the way you posited this with the EMR uh, marketing and uh, medical device manufacturers and, and their vendors and suppliers. You know, out of that, as selfish as I want to be, I would probably argue that your EMR is most important. Um, you know, something that, that tracks and, and, and runs fluidly within the office, you know, as, as important as I need to say I am at the end of the day, um, I, it, it's just not true. So you have to make sure that that stuff is on lock uh, even before you start addressing your marketing needs. I mean, we can, I, I think, agree that although important, the, the device definitely comes third in that. Um, that being said, it's not an expense. It is a way to potentially grow your practice. Without marketing, you're just not going to go anywhere. You know, and it's the same thing uh, anecdotally, or, or I guess if we're using an analogy, you know, it certainly costs gas to put into your car to go. And it's not something that's on the sticker price of the car. But without it, you're not going anywhere. Or, I mean, even if you're paying the electric bill and that shiny little beautiful Tesla in the garage, you don't charge that bad boy and you're not going anywhere. And you can buy that 
device that sits in your garage. Um, you know, and you can have all the, the, the technology and the EMR around it. But at the end of the day, if you want it to go, if you want it to flex, uh, you got to put some gas in that bad boy and, or you have to charge it up to the wall and you have to get that power going some way. And so if you understand that it is a, essentially a cost of doing business, and if we want the machine to go, this is the gas that it runs on. I think that's the first hurdle to overcome. And then stop looking at marketing as a cost, as a line item in and of itself. Use that as a barometer by which you measure what your ROI is, your rate of growth, and then depend, determine, is this too much? Is this too little? Where am I going? Am I hitting uh, the KPIs? Am I hitting the numbers that I want? Am I getting the growth that I'm looking for and I'm trying to achieve? Um, and dealing with a marketing company uh, that's not BSing you, okay? Because uh, there are a lot of unreasonable expectations in my world. And there are a lot of companies, unfortunately, that will promise you and will tell you, sure, we can do that or that is reasonable. And very few that will tell you, you're nuts. Um, I pride myself on being able to say that to people. Uh, and I know that there are some other quality agencies out there that do their best uh, to try and convey the same message. Maybe not as brashly as I will say it to you, but uh, there are some out there that certainly will. So uh, you have to understand that if you're just looking at it and say, look, this is costing me $1 or $10 or $100 or 100000 whatever the case is, that's not the right metric to be judging what your marketing is. Sure, it sounds like a lot or whatever the case might be, but you need to look at what is it generating for me? What is coming in and what does that formula actually look like? Uh, Jay, you run a small business. The people that are on and, and listening to this, they run businesses. I run a business. I have payroll. I have three offices, you know, broaching 100 employees. That payroll line item is horrible. And I absolutely hate that. I'm buying houses every two weeks, right? So it, it, it's a rough one to, to write that check proverbially for that. But that is the gas for the business that I run. And conversely, for the practice, you don't have the nurse. You're not going to have the support you need to to do what you need to do in surgery or that practitioner in that non-surgical environment. Or for you, if you don't have other consultants, you don't have any other way of doing it. So if you're looking at it, purely based on the number and not necessarily, all right, well, what are we getting out of it? And then I think that you're looking at it in the wrong way. Sam, let me, we have, I have two more questions for you, but one of them, speaking about gas, you know, you're talking about the gas that you're putting in that, at that car, whether it's a Kia or whether it's a Porsche or the electric that for the I actually Tesla. own both of those, by the way. Right. So. All three of those. those. You named them all right there. So, all right. Yeah. So let, let's, uh, that's why I mentioned that, by the way. Yeah. All right. Now, my question to you is, with the digital marketing company and a marketing agency, um, do I put in regular gas? Do I put in unleaded? Or do I put in premium unleaded? Meaning, I can spend $1,000 on my monthly spend. I can spend $1,500, $2,000, $3,000. You know, when I had our practice, this is going back around 2000 and 2001 for 15, 18 years that we had it. I spent $12,000 a month in yellow pages. I'm telling you full page, triple quarter columns. A lot of half fun pages. Books. Let me tell you something though. That was the only show in town. And I look back and could not fathom what I could get today for $12,000 a month nationwide let alone five or six different books from every little area. So I have, you know, we only have a few more minutes to go. If you can encapsulate it, how do I know how much money to spend on my monthly budget when I need you, Sam? You know, every company needs a digital marketing and a web company. So how do I know what do I spend? I got to put a budget together for our client when we first take clients on and as we manage them, you know, they ask us, Jay, how much should I be spending on my marketing? For okay, my so web, there's, yeah, my so there's, budget. right. So there's a formula, 
And I, I'm going to spit out the formula. A lot of you will probably not be able to jot it all down or maybe I'll miss something. So definitely email one of us and we'll, we'll get that over to you. But traditionally speaking, you need to, if we are in 2020, let's use 2021 as the example. If I'm putting together my small executive summary of what I want to accomplish in 2021, I'm going to look at where I want to be in terms of numbers and, and, and revenue and this, that, the other. I'm going to break my revenue down into two different parts. I'm going to break it down from existing patients and I'm going to break it down from new patients, right? And growth. Traditionally, the model looks like at it, its very simplest form. If you want to grow 10% or less. So say you're a million dollar practice and you all want to go to 1.1 million, your marketing budget should be somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 7% overall of your, uh, of your marketing. If you want to go between 10% growth to approximately 20 to 22% growth, uh, you're going to be spending right around 10% of your overall uh, revenue. And if you want to really boost it, really be um, on top of things and go over 25% growth, you're typically spending 15%. Okay. Yeah. But Overall. Sam, you said that's marketing, the, but, but website company is a portion of my marketing. So that's what I'm I, getting at. So okay. that's what I'm getting at of that overall budget. Right. So let's take a look and let's say, you know what, you want to go from 1 million to 1.2. Okay. Which is a 20% growth. You're going to fall in that tier two area. All right. Your overall budget amount that you're going to spend on marketing and, and you might allocate that towards in-house staff or you might allocate that just to vendors or TV or whatever it is, is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred grand. Okay. 120 grand a year or something like that, which is going to be about eight or $9,000 a month, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Roughly depending on your local market and what works for you and also the ratio of current patients uh, the returning patients and the referral practice versus new patients that typically looks like about a 70 30 split in terms of digital gets 70 and your traditional or other means typically get about 30 percent so a one to 1.2 million dollar practice that is looking to grow by about 20 percent should be spending somewhere in the neighborhood of around 6500 a month and that should be for website and seo and for social media and for ads and for PPC and for anything online and digital where you have the other 3,000, 3,500 or 4,000, depending on where you're at, going towards other things like maybe local magazines or maybe you're running a fundraiser or whatever it is. Everyone's got a variety of different things going on. That is a back of the napkin type of formula. And if you're getting numbers that are extravagantly high or extravagantly low, perhaps you see a great outsource deal. Sometimes those things are too good to be true, but it's always good. Ask a couple of people, go to a couple of agencies and figure out, all right, this is what I'm getting. Compare, obviously, apples to apples as opposed to like apples to dinosaurs um, and make sure that you're doing the right thing. And then you should fall within a standard deviation, maybe two of that bell curve that's not going to be um, crazy. If someone's trying to pitch to you, if you're a $1.2 million practice and they say, well, we can do everything for you for $1,100 a month, well, they're probably not going to move the needle very far. And then of course, if you get someone, they say, hey, we're going to charge you 30 grand a month. Um, you probably have some red flags there as well. Good. Sam, I've got, as always, every time we're together, every time we're on stage, it just goes on and on and on. And, you know, during these times, I've got dozens more questions to ask you. But I um, look forward to giving you a high five, an elbow bump, a normal hug. How are you doing? You know, Sam, the man. Uh, Sam, how could somebody get in touch with you um, if they want um, we have uh, Sure Solutions, the webinar, Sure Solutions, the podcast. Our next webinar um, is going to be with Brad Adato from the law firm of Bird and Adato speaking about, you know, what your practice needs to do uh, if you and or your staff gets COVID. And of course, Mara has a uh, Sure Solutions, the podcast. Go on to our site if you're interested in to reviewing any one of them. But Sam, I'd like to give you a shout out if you could. How would somebody be able, Mara, you can come back off. Uh, how would somebody be able to get in touch with uh, incredible marketing if they want additional information, if they 
coming into the business yeah. and they're looking I for get a digital marketing firm. <laughs> so just hit incrediblemarketing.com. There's a form there, obviously, that you can fill out. We have a an immense library of free education for the startup practice, for the medium-sized practice, for the large practice uh, that addresses everything from creating content to how to do it yourself to is selecting an agency right for me and what are some of the factors you should look into. It's an entire just library of information that's free that you should use to educate yourself, especially if you have more time. Um, and then personally, you can send me an email, sam at incrediblemarketing.com. Pretty simple. And or find me on Instagram. So incredible Sam Peak. Uh, you take a look and, and you can find me on there and you can send me a message and go ahead and slide on into those DMs. As always, Sam, it's to see you. I always appreciate listening to your expert advice and, you know, your critique and educational pearls. And I always love traveling with you, man. It's like, you know, that long story behind um, that is Sam loved it. And I had a paper cut out. As you can see, it's when I had hair. And it was right before Sam was traveling to Australia over Christmas a couple of years back. And I cut it out and I went to FedEx real quick to send it to him. And they told me it was going to cost me close to $100 to send it over to California right by Christmas. And I had to get there because, Chris, because Sam was going out of the country. I said, I don't care what this costs. It has to get to Sam before he leaves the country. So I travel with Sam all the time. As always, Sam, it is a pleasure. Mara, if you would like to share anything before we close, um, please feel free to pop in. Uh, please feel free to listen to Shore Solutions, the webinar, Shore Solutions, the podcast. We are Shore, S-H-O-R-R, -R, solutions, plural, because we have more than one solution. And Mara, I'll leave it with you to close. Sure. Thank you so much to everybody that attended today. If you have additional questions, please feel free to send us an email to info at shoresolutions.com. You can find us on social media at Shore Solutions. You can also, as Jay said, find our podcast, Shore Solutions, the podcast, wherever you find your favorite, uh, wherever you find your favorite podcast. I also encourage you to go ahead and listen and follow all of Incredible Marketing channels because they're absolutely amazing. So thank you all so much for joining today. And again, we will be having our next webinar next week. So we encourage you to tune in, get on our e-newsletter for all the latest information. Have a great day, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys. Be safe, everybody.